This morning, as you can see, we've set up for Holy Communion, and so I'm not going to be very long, but I want to invite you to turn with me um, to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, and we're going to be reading from verse 1 to 12. Mark chapter 2 and verse 1 to 12. And I'm reading in the New American Standard Bible. And this is what it says. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone, so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Have you ever been invited somewhere and when you got there, you immediately felt out of place? Has that ever happened to you? Now, hopefully, if you're visiting us today, this isn't the occasion, hopefully. But maybe it is. I know the feeling. I remember a time when I was invited somewhere, and when I got there, I felt very out of place. And the crazy thing was, everybody else there was acting as this was the most normal thing in the world. I was in South Korea, as many of you maybe know my lovely wife, Jody. You can tell who she is. She's the most beautiful woman in the, in the room. That's how you know. And um, she's very lucky to have me. <laughs> and I'm even luckier to have her. But anyway, right, so I'm in South Korea. This is where I met Jody. And in South Korea, I was teaching English and the Bible. And so we made some friendships with some of the Korean teachers at the school where we were. And there was a holiday time, we had three or four days off, and they invited us to go to the East Sea, okay? The East Sea, the East Coast. And in Korea, on the East Coast, there is this very famous beach for Koreans, and many of you have experienced this beach, because this is a beach where they get that very special mineralized sea mud, which apparently is good for your face, okay? Have you ever paid like 10 pounds in the shop for mud? And they, you know, and they claim that this mud will make you look 15 years younger and, you know, 10 pounds lighter and your hair will grow and every, you know, they claim all these things, right? But this is the beach where it actually comes from and it's free. You just go there and you just slather yourself with mud and roll in the mud and you just, you basically act like a hippopotamus for a few hours, okay? So we went there and it was great. We rolled around and we played and then... Towards the end, we started, to, we started to realize something, at least I started to realize something. How are we going to get clean, you know? I have completely ruined the clothes that I came in. I was having a good time, but now how am I going to get clean? And the genius of the Koreans is that they built what I would have called a spa, but they call a jimjilbang, okay? They had built this jimjilbang, this spa, right next to the beach. And so our friend said, oh, it's cool, don't worry, everyone rolls here, and then we go to the spa, to the gym gym and we have a nice relaxing sauna and stuff, and we wash it all off, and we feel good. So I think, all right, this is great. So now let me, I should give you some context. Um, 
I'm not the smallest guy you'll ever meet. I think I, think I can, that's fair to say. Um, I, and even in England, I'm, I'm a bigger guy in all dimensions, okay? But in Korea, I was huge, you know what I'm saying? Like, people saw me, and they saw the scripture coming to life, David and Goliath, you know, it was, it was, it was disturbing. So anyway, so, so in general, in Korea, I was used to being, you know, outside of the sizes that were available. But they said to me, don't worry, don't worry, we'll go there. And I was saying, but we don't have a towel, don't worry, they have towels, they have everything, it's all taken care of. So I thought, okay. So we went to the spa, I'm talking about being invited somewhere and feeling awkward. We paid our money, and they gave me the towel. Now, it, wasn't, it really wasn't much bigger than this, I promise you. It really, and I was like, I mean, what do you even, how do you even, I mean, what would, how would this work, right? They gave me the towel, and um, I'd been in Korea for almost a couple of years now, so I'd got used to a lot. In Korea, it, it's a lot more friendly than it is here. You know in the gym where you have the separate cubicles? Not so in Korea. In Korea, everything's out in the open. So men went one way, women went another way, just so that you know it was cool. Men went, so I went, I went this way with the, with the, with the guys. My, my wife, or fiance at the time, went the other way with the girls. And um, we went into the changing area, and they were just talking and laughing and taking off their clothing. And I was like, <laughs> okay, so I took off my top, and then I was realizing that this was not just a top-only experience. But I'm, but I'm a missionary, and I'm, and I'm here, and I'm trying to get in with the culture, and I'm trying to be, you know, so, you know, Paul says, I am all things to all men, so I thought, well, okay. And I have my towel, so, you know, and I'm feeling very uncomfortable. But we get in there, and then there's like a, the sauna, so I jump right in the water, and then, you know, I'm up to my neck in the water, and I feel good. Okay, this I can handle this. This I can handle. So, so I'm there after about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, I start to feel more relaxed. I actually start enjoying myself. I, I start becoming less self-conscious as I realize, actually, no one here is looking at me. Everyone here is just relaxed. So let me chill out. Let me not be the weird foreigner who makes everything weird. So everything's fine. And then I discover that there are several stages in the spa experience. You start off in the first soaking pool, which has some of the sea salt in it, but then you have to move to another pool. But in between that pool, there is a trough of the most finest, best quality mud that you have to apply liberally to yourself to soak out the toxins before going to the next stage, okay? And I'm thinking, I'm looking, and I'm seeing, and I'm thinking, this is awkward, but you know, you know Jesus said, I will be with you always, so okay. In the name of Jesus, so I go. And I'm quick. Now, you, you see me moving and you think that I'm, I'm kind of, I, I work in slow motion, but I was fast that day. I was, I was lathering up and I was putting the mud everywhere I could get it so I could get back into the next pool and be you know, up to my neck. And then I felt a hand. It was almost like something out of the book of Daniel, the hand that appeared in the wall. I felt a hand on my back and I looked at my one hand and I looked at my other hand and I realized it wasn't my hand. And this hand was applying mud in the places that I could not reach. And I turned around, and there stood before me a man who I had never met before, who spoke no English, but his smile told me everything I needed to know. Brother, I've got your back. And he applied mud, and he, that, he applied mud, that's all I can say. Uh, we didn't exchange numbers, I don't know who he is, but uh, if we ever meet in heaven, there'll be a connection that we only share. Why do I tell you this? I tell you this because for me, this was the most awkward, embarrassing situation in the world possible. But for them, it was completely normal. He was just being a nice, friendly neighbor. You know over here, like when you have to cross the road, you say after you, in Korea, you just put a little mud on a stranger's back. There's nothing weird with that, but to me. And so I tell you this story because it can be awkward when you are invited by your friend to somewhere else, and especially when everybody else seems to know what's going on and everybody else seems to be comfortable, and you feel like, am I the only one here who doesn't get it? 
The story that we just read, I believe this paralytic had that experience. His four friends invited him, well, invited him, how much can a paralytic sort of protest, invited him to go meet Jesus. And they carry this man, and they get to the house where Jesus is, and here's what happens. Jesus was kind of like, at that time, like a celebrity. Even though there was no Twitter and no Facebook, somehow people always knew where he was. And when it got out where he was, everyone flocked there. And so he came home, and he was hiding out in the house for a few days, and eventually he got out. Oh, Jesus is in town. And everyone flocked to his house, and everyone pushed into the, the living room and spilled out into the kitchen and, and, and out even to the front door. And they were all there because they wanted to hear Jesus preach. Because when he preached, lives were changed. And people had come to recognize that when they heard his voice, they felt hope, they felt inspired, they felt that they could do the impossible, that they could live even under the Roman yoke. And so they wanted to hear him speak. They wanted to go there, watch this, because they needed something. And so because they had a need that they thought Jesus could fill, they crushed in as close as they possibly could to get to him. But what they didn't realize is that in doing so, they made it impossible for a paralytic person to come in. And when the paralytic came that day, what he saw was a whole group of church people with their backs to him and the community huddling around Jesus and oblivious of his situation. And do you know what? I think the same thing happens today. The statistics tell us that there are less and less people who go to church in 2014. And you know, it's easy for us to sit here and blame, well, it's this, it's that. But you know what I think perhaps the biggest reason why people don't go to church? Church people. We, we get in the way. Maybe it's the way that we dress, you know. For some of you, you came here this morning and you weren't aware that this was a wedding. And you're like, well, that's confusing. I, I didn't realize it was this kind of occasion. For some of us, it's, our, it's, it's the songs that we sing from the 18th century, you know? We, we're singing 18th century songs on an app. Isn't that ironic? It's kind of, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's our culture. Sometimes as, 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 as a church, we don't do very good at, at, at being open. But whatever reason it is, sometimes church can seem intimidating, and it can seem like we're all just huddled around this thing, and we all think it's amazing, but our backs are to the community. And if you're not like one of us, if you can't push your way in, then there's no room for you. And many people have turned away because they thought, well, they all seem like they're having a good time. But I guess this is not for me. And if you feel like that this morning, if you've ever felt like that, I want to apologize to you on behalf of the church. Forgive us. In our defense, it wasn't intentional. It's not that these people were trying to keep the paralytic out. That's not, that's not why they did it. They were just so desperate to hear Jesus themselves that they didn't even stop to think how it might seem to others. Forgive us. We, 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 we desperately want to connect with Jesus. You see, Christians are not better than other people. That's, that's not why we're Christians. We just recognize that we have such a need that we would take time out every week to come to this place to meet these same people because somehow we feel that it gives us something that we can't get elsewhere. So these people crowded around. But the good thing about this story is that these man's friends would not allow the situation at that time to prevent them from bringing him to Jesus. Because these man's friends recognize something that's very important. And I hope you understand this, because if you understand this, it could potentially change your life. These man's friends recognized that church is not about the people. Church is about meeting Jesus. Let me say it again. Church is not about the people. It's about meeting Jesus. Now, should the people be nicer? Yes. Should they be more loving? Yes. Should they practice what they preach? Yes. But church is not about the people. It's about meeting Jesus. And so these man's friends realized that only Jesus could change him. And so they were willing to do whatever it took to get him in the presence of Jesus. And so watch what they do. They climb the roof. Now think about this. You're carrying a paralytic person. How do you climb and hold him? That would have been a difficult situation. They may have had to step on the heads and the shoulders of some people who were trying to listen at the door to get on the roof. And having got to the roof, 
of a house they didn't own, they start tearing the roof down. Right? Can you imagine the scene? They're pulling up. Now, now the roofs in those days were not like today where they just had the, the roof tiles. They were made of like mud, and then there was straw, and then there were twigs, and then there were you know, other branches. So they're flinging off branches and mud, and, and down below, it's raining on people, and they're trying to listen to the sermon, and it's, what's, what's that terrible racket? And eventually, they break through, and it starts falling on the people who are inside, and eventually, they make a hole big enough to send their friend through. Because true friends are less interested in structure and more interested in function. Let me say that again. A true friend who's trying to bring their friend to Jesus is less interested in structure and more in function. In other words, that had been a roof for generations. We've always used that to keep the rain off. But that morning they realized we need to change it up. That thing that we've been using, using as a roof Today it becomes a door. And if we have to bust through it, breaking years of tradition, we're going to do it because we're going to get this man to Jesus. And he won't fit any other way. As Christians, we need to get to the place where we're willing to change everything that can possibly be changed to make as much space as possible for people to come to Jesus who otherwise might not fit or feel comfortable. So they do it. They break through the, through the, through the roof They lower their friend, and wouldn't you know it, on the front row, there are the elders, and they start to have theological problems with what is happening, right? There are always going to be people, when you want to do something different, when you're trying to get to Jesus, there are always going to be naysayers. Sometimes they're in the church, sometimes they're your friends. So so what you think, there's a God now. But you think we, the world was created. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll try and say stuff. They'll try and, they'll try and prevent you from getting the healing and the blessing that you need. But don't let them hold you back. Jesus reaches out to this man and he says, your sins are forgiven. In other words, he says to him, uh, you don't have to live a life of guilt and shame. And then he says to him, take up your bed, take up your pallet and go. In other words, you can live differently than the way you have lived to this point. And this is what happens when you encounter Jesus. We do all this stuff, we sing from the book, we read the Bible, we wear a tie, but that's not really what this is about. The only reason why we are here, the only reason why I am here, is because I have met a person who has allowed me to no longer have to live with the guilt and shame of my past life. And I have met a person who continually reminds me that I can live differently than I have lived before. And so, that man left that day, having not been able to walk in, he walked out. (laughs) And he left everybody there who had been crowding around Jesus, and he was the only person who had really been changed. He walked out that day, and everyone said, this is amazing. We've never seen anything like this before. But my question, my final question is, why did his friends go to this trouble? Why did they invite him? Why did they carry him? Why did they, why did they fight to get him in? Why did they, why did they do, go to all that trouble to bring him to Jesus? Why didn't they say to themselves at the first huddle, you know what, let's just give up. It's clearly full. They clearly aren't interested. They clearly don't want anything to do with us. Why didn't they give up? It's because his friends recognized that Jesus can free you of the guilt of your past and Jesus can give you hope for future. You know, an idea can be discussed, can be debated, can be disagreed about, but Jesus is not an idea, he's a person. And the person can only be experienced. They could have stayed home and talked to their friend about Jesus. Well, Jesus can do this and he can do that. that. But they said, no, 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 let's not even talk. Let's just bring him to a place where he might be able to experience Jesus. And if he experiences Jesus for himself, then he'll know that there's something there. And he'll then be able to figure out the answers to all the questions that he has. 
And if I'm honest, if you've been invited here today, it's because your friend is secretly hoping that you might experience something today, that you might experience Jesus. Maybe you've had conversations, maybe you haven't. But we've come here today, and we have this communion here today because the communion service is the best way we know how. In 2014, in a worship service like this, to experience the presence of Jesus. Let me tell you very briefly the story, and we'll close. Before Jesus died, he got 12 of his disciples, his closest friends together, and they had a meal, a typical Jewish meal. They had bread and they had grape juice, they had wine. And Jesus, recognizing that this would be the last time he would eat with them, the last supper, as we call it, he decided to try to infuse these everyday basic uh, parts of life with deeper meaning. And so taking the bread that they would always use, something today like our naan bread, a flat piece of bread that was roasted, he said, this is no longer just bread to you. I want you to think of this now as like my body, that which I'm going to sacrifice to you, for you. And this grape juice, this is no longer just a drink now. I want you to think of this as, as my very blood, my life. Now, Jesus wasn't trying to create some weird cannibalistic cult. That's not what he was trying to do. What he was trying to do is explain to them that I want you to realize that I'm going to be gone physically, but you need to experience me spiritually just as much as you experience eating and drinking. I've got to be that real to you. And so he said, every time you eat, Every time you drink, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. And we, in the Adventist Christian Church, we have a communion service about every three months because we think it's special. And we start by uh, a service that we call foot washing, which I, <laughs> it's not quite as weird as going to a gym job in Korea. Uh, but, but if you've never done it, it is a bit strange. But let me explain what we're doing and why. Jesus, at that same supper, he decided to show an example of humility by washing the feet of his disciples. And he said to them, if I'm your master and I can wash your feet, then you should do it to others. And we act that out. We reenact that in the Adventist church, not because we think there's any special power in the water, no, but because we are trying to remind ourselves of our need to be humble. So that's what we do. If, if you feel uncomfortable with that, you're not forced to do that. But we have the foot washing, and then we come and we eat unleavened piece of bread and some grape juice, and we pray. And I don't know about some of you, but for me, I can't explain it, but all I can tell you is that every time I have communion, when I'm finished, I'm filled with this sense of peace, this sense of hope. I just, I just feel cleaner. I feel hopeful. I feel as if God has touched me. And my prayer today is that whether you are a visitor or whether this is your hundredth communion, you might experience the presence of God today. We're going to separate and we're going to go. The, the ladies are going to go downstairs for privacy. The gents are going to be up here. We're going to wash each other's feet. We, we practice an open communion, so that means you don't have to be a member. You don't have to be even a Christian. But if you're, we, we, are, we sorry, how can I say this? We practice an open communion as long as you're open to it. So if you're open to really engaging with it, you're welcome to engage. So come. If you just want to watch, that's fine. We're going to be playing a video from the life of Christ here for those who are staying for whatever reason. And um, we're going to go wash each other's feet and we're going to come back. We're going to have communion and then we'll leave. Let's say a prayer together. Father God, we thank you that you are a God who calls us to you even if we have to come in through the roof. We thank you that you are able to touch us, that you are able to forgive us of our guilt and shame and heal us so that we can live lives that are different. And I want to pray for everyone who's here this morning, whether they're a guest, whether they're uh, a regular. We all are in the same boat. We all need to experience you afresh. And we pray that through these symbolic things that we now do in communion, we might really experience the presence of Jesus in our hearts. In your name we pray. 